Hello, and welcome. <laughs> My name is Jason Van Hee, and I'm happy to say that tonight we have the pleasure to welcome the immensely talented Mary Roach. Mary will be joined in conversation with Paul Constant, co-founder of the wonderful Seattle Review of Books and a longtime friend of the University Bookstore. We're very excited to have them with us tonight as one of the more than 500 events the University Bookstore hosts and sponsors every year. And we're pleased, too, to be here in the beautiful Town Hall, one of the many venues we host events in, from our own main store in the University District to our branch stores around Puget Sound and including off-site locations like Town Hall. I said Mary Roach was immensely talented, and it's entirely true. Her talent isn't just with writing, although she is an extraordinary writer. Her talent is this. She can make me read about and enjoy things that would normally make me squirm in my seat. And maybe I'm still squirming while I read, but I'm reading and I'm loving. Whether it's an examination of the processes of death, a look inside the churning grotesquerie of our innards, or an investigation of how the world gets really, really friendly, Mary has a rare ability to communicate the most ticklish of subjects in the most entrancing of ways. When I first encountered Stiff a decade ago, I didn't quite know what to think. Here was a book about a topic normally barely discussed, going into great depth with both sensitivity and charm, a mountain of charm. So let's talk about that. Mary puts herself into every narrative because she's right there experiencing what she's writing about and perhaps never more so than with her latest book, Grunt. Grunt is Mary Roach at her absolute best. We see here that great talent I spoke of, taking subjects that are disgusting, the use of maggots in medicine, for instance, or too sensitive, their reconstruction of war-ravaged penises, or just ludicrously silly, the secret development of stink bombs with peculiar names and histories, and making each one as compelling as the last, as fascinating, and as vital. In looking into the science and medicine that sustains, supports, and work with the military, Mary has turned the burning light of her ability on dark spaces and subjects too often ignored. We forget sometimes that there are men and women suffering and dying for our protection every day. We don't think about how that works, how they manage to do it, or what enormous sacrifices and requirements are laid on those who serve. Grunt tells a part of that story, though, with curiosity, interest, affection, and yes, with a slight relish at the grossness. Perhaps that's part of what Mary teaches us through her works, that we need to dive a little into the things we don't want to consider. And fortunately, she makes it so very easy to take that leap. Without further ado, I give you Mary Roach in conversation with Paul Constant. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, so I have some questions that I'm going to ask, and then I have uh, some questions from you, and we will have time for uh, a lot of them. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for coming out, and that introduction was amazing. Uh, all right, so, oh, thank you. We have uh, talked in the past, and you uh, said, I think on several occasions, that uh, you have uh, no real scientific experience. That's right? I just want to sort of reiterate that you, fact. Like, like degrees and that kind yes. of thing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, no, I have a BA in psychology. Okay. <laughs> uh, maybe you should be asking the questions. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so you sort of learn as you go along as you write a book, right? You don't go in with, with prior knowledge beyond anything you've learned from previous books. Um, and I lost my question. It's right here somewhere. Uh, so, how did you, so how do you decide on a subject? How did you decide to write about, uh, write about military and grunt? 
Uh, this topic came to me in a, uh, uh, not a very straightforward way. I was reporting um, uh, a piece for Smithsonian Magazine on the world's, uh, arguably the world's hottest chili pepper and, uh, uh, in India, and this pepper, someone told me when I was there, that had been weaponized by the Indian Defense Ministry. They'd made kind of a, well, you know, like a pepper spray, but a powder, and sort of sustainably locally grown peppers were they used. And, so I felt that I needed to report on that aspect of this uh, chili pepper. So I, I went to this lab in Assam, the state of Assam, India. And while I was there, there was the chili pepper, which well, they never deployed, they never used it, it, it because it was prone to mildew. So I never, <laughs> it didn't work out. They shelved it, that was it. So, but the, while I was there, the, um, the, 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 the lab director was working on a leech repellent a substance, no leech repellent, there was no such thing, so they were uh, testing various compounds, like going down to the river in monsoon season and rolling up their trousers and testing this leech repellent. And, and at that moment, I thought that military science might be uh, just, you know, more broader, more esoteric, more roachable, if you will, <laughs> than one might have imagined. So that's, the, the seed was planted from from that trip, and then when I came home, uh, a reader wrote to me, he was a retired army pathologist, and I, in, in a correspondence that we struck up, I said, you know, I'm kind of thinking about military science, I don't know, the access was probably impossible, and he said, no, I don't think so. And he said, I, I would, why don't you come out to Dover, I'll introduce you to people I know, at the, the Dover is the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, when anybody is killed, in combat, they, the bodies come back to uh, to Dover, and there's a t team of medical examiners. Anyway, so he introduced me there, and that's sort of where it began, and that's how it happened. Yeah, okay. I don't have any family uh, in the military. I don't. Well, my dad was my dad was is really old. He was born in 1894. Uh, he's dead now, obviously. <laughs> But he had, uh, I know, yeah. Your dad was, okay, all right. That's... My dad was 65 when I was born. Wow. Um, anyway, so he, he, and he came over here, and uh, he, he enlisted in World War I, um, but he got a hernia during basic training, <laughs> and that was it. That's the illustrious Roach <laughs> military history. That's it, yeah. Wow. Uh, you, you previously wrote uh, Packing to Mars about uh, NASA, so were you, were you shaking any of the same trees for contacts in this book? Uh, no, there were no, there was, there, there weren't any of the same folks that I had uh, interviewed in NASA, uh, but, but the, my experience with NASA had m made me think that access was going to be problematic for this book because sometimes NASA was, uh, for no real reason, a kind of, um, just, just uncomfortable with me. I don't know. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Just like, just, I don't know, not, they, not, like, what's she up to? <laughs> what does she want from us? What's she going to do? Huh. Uh, and, and so how did that compare to the experience of this book? I think maybe because of, because of that experience, I, I started out, uh, the, the, the office of the Secretary of Defense, there is a public affairs office for books, and, and they don't, you can give them a proposal and kind of get a nod. It's not like they're going to open any doors. They can't make anybody talk to you, but they can sort of they just say, yeah, we're kind of okay with this. I thought it would be a, a letter with a stamp and like gold embossed letter and ribbons or something. It was just this hastily typed email that I could have, you know, deleted the not <laughs> from and made it, yes, we are willing to support this. Uh, if just an email that I would then, I could forward to someone if they had any sort of concerns about is this going to cause problems in my career? You know, am I going to get in trouble? But that so so um, I think because of the NASA experience, I decided let, let me just feel this out up front and see if it's going to be a problem. But people were re actually very helpful because I, I don't I, and most of the work in this book doesn't get a lot of attention. You know, a lot of a lot of what is covered when people cover the military is, is you know, the, the scandals or the action, the drama, the combat. Mm -hmm. You know, not that many people are writing about military entomology or, 
you know, or the bioengineering, or the, you know, the, that stuff kind of isn't on the public's radar. So I think they were actually fine with my writing about it. Okay. And was your, was your approach always to do the, the non-combat side? Of the, of the military, or did you go in with a with a, a sort of a broader scope? I would. I had thought that I was uh, would was going to embed, and I wasn't sure with whom because there's not a lot of science going on out in the units that you might embed with. I had so I started out. I thought I would embed with the Fifth Marine Corps Dental Battalion <laughs> because <laughs> I just loved the idea of a Marine Corps dental battalion. I pictured them coming down from the air with little picks <laughs> and blue smocks, and that just tickled my fancy. Uh, but the Marine, the, the dental battalion wasn't, uh, there wasn't really anything going on for, that, for me to embed with them. So, I mean, they were, they were a little perplexed, like, what? What do you what do you want to do? I'm like I want to embed with you. <laughs> I want to follow you into action. Um, so that didn't go anywhere. And then and then I thought, um, although it did, you know, I, mean, I can now. It, it's all, it made me just as much fun to say the Fifth Marine Corps Dental Battalion as to actually embed with them. Uh, so then I then I thought, well, I would I'd like to. I was going to embed with the Chaplain's Corps. Because when, when I was at uh, U.S. Army Natick, where they make the food, the clothing, the backpacks, the tents, kind of the accessories of combat, there was a chaplain at Natick, and, and he had, you know, he gave me a little, there was a camouflage Bible, there were camouflage vestments for the priests, there was a little tiny, like, thumb drive Bible, there was a portable communion kit and a containerized confessional, and I, like, this kind of stuff I love. So I, I was supposed to be there reporting on uniforms, and I just kept going, like, can I go hang out with the chaplain again? <laughs> uh, so the chaplain, the, the cha uh, uh, and I was actually approved to, to, to go, and the chaplain, but the chaplains, what's interesting is that the, the chaplains go out with a unit, you know, say it's somebody, uh, a unit that's doing road clearance where they're, where they're um, finding IEDs and getting rid of them, sometimes they explode, uh, and, and the chaplains, go along. So they have this ability to em empathize in a way. I mean, I wasn't, I'm not a religious person and I wasn't so much fascinated by the, by the religion, el religious element of what they do, but the fact that they put themselves at risk and go out with these units. And there's the chaplain, and then I love this, the chaplain does not carry a weapon. He doesn't have a rifle, but the chaplain's assistant covers the chaplain. It's like, <laughs> a kind of, the covers the chaplain. So, uh, and I, but part of me was kind of like, who covers Mary? Because <laughs> if you embed, you got to you get your you got to buy your body armor, which I, I wasn't prepared for. There's there's a place that's sort of it's like like Trader Joe's, but it's like Soldier Joe's. It's kind of a and it's, you can get used body armor cheap. And I'm like, do you want used body armor? I don't know. Uh, anyway, so that was my uh, that was the plan, but. Um, it was during the drawdown in Afghanistan, and, and there really wasn't as, there wasn't a lot going on. And the U.S. Army approved it, but ISAF, which is the coalition group, uh, nixed it because they were only sending daily journalists who were really specifically focused on what the missions were, and not some goober who wanted to hang out with the chaplains. <laughs> <laughs> so. So anyway, uh, I don't even know what your question was. What that's that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it seems like it must have been difficult to get access to a submarine, uh, say, at the end of the book, you're, you're, you're on the submarine. That seems like yeah. it would be the sort of thing that they would not be very eager to have somebody who's written five books about. Uh, yeah, that, well, that was about a year and a half of, um, I, I, I kind of end up stalking my subjects. <laughs> it was, no, there was, um, that ended up happening because the director of research at the Naval Submarine Medical Research Lab in Groton had read one of my, maybe stiff, I'm not sure what he had read, but, and he was due to retire the next year. And he said, you know, the Navy has a, 
we're very closed. We tend to just pull our wagons in a circle when somebody comes and asks questions. And that's what we do, and I don't see why we do it. We do good work here, and I think we should say yes to this. And I know a lot of people are gonna disagree with me, but I'm retiring and I don't give a shit. <laughs> so he kept at it, and I like, so for a year and a half, I, you know, every other week, I'm like, hey, Jerry, what's going on? Any closer, anything I can do? You know, uh, so it took, it, it took a while, and it took a lot of, uh, um, you know, dead, there were a lot of dead ends and backing up and trying somewhere else, and kind of getting bounced, you know, he, we ended up having to go pretty f high up the chain of command, and then when that was approved, then it was a matter of finding the individual commanding officer of a submarine who was willing to say, yeah, that'll be my submarine that this idiot can come on with her questions in her notebook and, you know, making a pest of herself, kicking someone out of their bunk and, um, you know, for five, uh, four days, I think it was four days I was on board. The only reason it worked, because those subs are out, a, a, a ballistic missile submarine, this is a, a, like a floating nuclear arsenal, um, and it's, it's uh, uh, out at sea for months. It, because it has a nuclear reactor as power, it doesn't have to come up and refuel, so no one, very few people, including me, know where it is. I don't know where I was. We went out for eight hours from Kings Bay, Georgia, in the middle of the night. In the morning, this thing popped up. They laid down a gangplank, and myself, and it was five um, prospective commanding officers who were doing a practical exam for a few days. So I went along, I was able to go along with them. So that's how it came about. We finally found a way to, because uh, there aren't very many short outings on a sub. They tend to be out right. for a long time. Right. So yeah. that's how, so it, yeah, just persistence. <laughs> persistence, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> were, you, were you bummed that they didn't let you see the reactor? No. No, <laughs> no I, I, wasn't, I wasn't bummed at all that didn't let me see the reactor. What does the reactor look like? I don't know. I think, but you know, it was um, because these prospective commanding officers were on board, they did all of these amazing um, uh, run-throughs, tests, uh, like um, simulations. They, they did a, a simulated attack, like we're gonna launch all the missiles, which is just, is this, it was like, a, it was a pretend Armageddon. So that was really trippy and, and bizarre. And, uh, and I, and they let, you know, they, I was, so I mean, the missile compartment is huge. I mean, submarines, some of, there are two kinds. There's a small kind and a big kind. I was on the big kind because there's two rows of 20 some, you know, silos with Trident missiles. And, and weirdly, because there's more crew than they can accommodate on there. A, a bunch of men sleeping between the missile silos, because it's kind of the quiet. It's kind of like the stacks at a library. It's kind of a. <laughs> it's just quiet, and there's nobody needs to be there unless they're pretending to launch all of the missiles. Uh, so, so that's kind of a, a nice place to sleep. Uh, anyway, so it was um, fascinating. Yeah, I wonder if they call those Trump drills right now. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it, it might be because I, I, I read the book uh, this week. I said in my review on the site that it feels almost like a, a, a political act that you, that you said in the beginning of the book that you weren't going to focus on, on guns uh, in the course of the, the book. Um, and you talked a little bit about this, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there was a point where you realized that you didn't have to write about that, or, or if there was a decision that you made where you're, where, you know, because there's, it's, glamorizing guns is very easy, and uh, probably yeah. would have been a lot of people who'd be willing to talk to you about that. Yes. Uh, and so I wondered if you could talk a little bit yeah. specifically about the firearms part of the situation. Right, right. Well, there are a number of reasons why I didn't, the book isn't about weapons and guns, um, partly because there's, there's so many, I mean, the Discovery Channel does a lovely job of <laughs> glamorizing high-tech weapons, as does Wired.com and lots of de defense um, department websites, so, so that gets a lot of coverage. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a technology gal. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, bodies are my bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, I, I like to write about the human, the human body, the human entity in and sometimes in a ex sort of extreme or unusual circumstances, like packing for Mars, was you know human beings in an environment for which they didn't evolve. You know, they people evolved for Earth gravity and Earth atmosphere, and you take them and you take them out of that, and it's a real challenge to keep them alive and thriving. So, 
Um, so I think that book is the closest to this book. It's a sim you know, it's similarly taking somebody and putting them in this extreme heat and with extreme exhaustion and noise and chaos and fear and you know, a, 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 just a just a tremendous load of stress and and difficulty. And and how do you how do you cope with that? And how does science make it maybe a little easier to deal with? So so that to me was interesting. It's not uh, partly because I'm more interested in the human side of things, but also because it, it, it doesn't get the coverage mm -hmm. that, you know, it's not the sexy part of the military. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't, I don't want to glamorize weapons and bombs and killing. I, I hate that shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a, there was a moment in the book, I was at Camp Pendleton where there's a, a group of military audiologists who were because hearing loss is a huge issue. I mean, it's the number one VA expense. It's a billion dollars a year. People come away with a lot of hearing loss. It's kind of an invisible problem. You know, people, you know, the, the showier stuff is the, you know, the missing limbs and, and PTSD. And, and, but hearing loss is, is it's, it's huge and it's incredibly common. And it's kind of a challenge because, yeah, you, it's easy to protect hearing, but if you're a soldier, your situational awareness comes, like 50% of it is from your hearing. So they don't want to put on, they don't want to protect their ears. Because they'd rather save their lives than save their hearing. So, you know, how do you protect hearing and, and not compromise someone's safety? So anyway, um, I was at Camp Pendleton for this um, sort of a tactical demonstration thing with the uh, military audiologists and there were some Marine Corps Special Operations guys who were taking them out on a just sort of a demonstration of this technology which could facilitate communication but also protect the ears mm -hmm. and part of that there was a, a segment of it where we were uh, we were firing M16s which I think it was sort of like hey military audiologists come fire M16s with special operations guys and sort of like it was sort of a bait, I think, um, which kind of worked for me too, because I, I don't, I've never, I've never fired a gun, and uh, but it, and on the one hand, it was, you know, it's it's it, it target practice, you know, hitting a target and 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 the whole th thing. I mean, it's kind of fun, mm -hmm. but it's really chilling that it's fun, and um, you know, par part of me, you know, I was very aware when I was writing it up that this. I ended up talking about just the act of pulling a trigger and how the verbs that you use are squeeze or pull when really it's just a twitch. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, and, I, it, and it just seems so wrong that like to take a human life could be just this just little, you know, it just felt like it, need, it should have a little more muscle to it. I don't yeah, know, just yeah. to, that you could just so cavalierly. You know, it's anyway. easier to flip somebody off than it it's is easy, to. Yeah, yeah. Exa yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, but I, but yeah, what were we? Yeah, anyway, <laughs> yeah, guns. So, so there is that scene, but I, but I was very aware of not, even though it was like, oh, I hit the target, wow, you know, but that's like, this is not an arcade game. This is an M16 rifle. Semi-automatic rifle, and 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 you know, so it's and it, it it's it was a chilling demonstration of, of of how, you know, people can get sucked into the kind of the game and the thrill and the fun of firing mm -hmm. guns. And it's you know, I was on a shooting range, but I don't know, especially with the events of this week, just it just um, anyway, I. I the chicken gun is more my speed. Yeah. The chicken gun. The chicken yeah. gun is a it fires thawed supermarket chickens at jet canopies just to, to for birds protection, you know, making sure that they withstand bird strike. If you hit a bird, anyway, um, the chicken gun. That's as far into guns as I want to get. <laughs> Unfortunately, the chickens aren't alive because I like to envision the sound. They're they they weren't alive, right? Quack, yeah, quack, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah it was, <laughs> yeah, it's very far side. Or Muppet Show, I was thinking. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Either one works, I think. Um, <laughs> so, uh, were these people, because uh, you talk about the relationship with this book to, to Packing with Mars, which I can totally see, um, but Packing for Mars sort of plays into that whole uh, uh, journeying out and, and exploration and all that, whereas this one, a lot of the people you talk to are 
employed by a complex, like a military industrial complex, to do the exact opposite of what the military industrial complex wants to do. Like yeah. they are, right. they are repairing the harm to bodies that uh, that that are supposed right. that is supposed to be done. Um, was there uh, any sort of a thread between the people who worked? Did they all have a similar sense of humor or or uh, or a heightened sense of irony or something like that? Um, I think you know, in the back of my mind was always as an organization, the military puts, has historically and currently puts a lot of effort into keeping people alive to finish the mission, to finish the job when the job is killing. And that irony is very present in my mind, but I think that the people, you know, if you're a surgeon and you're seeing people coming in maimed and blown apart day after day, you're focus is on life saving those those lives and that's you know and and I don't I don't think that they I think they see that as a as a worthwhile and a worthwhile mission and you know that they don't cut, that, that 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 isn't preying on their mind in the same way that you know we're keeping them alive to put them back out there I think they're just like let's freaking save this guy's life mm -hmm. or and and most of the you know, people at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System, these are not fans of war. You know, these, are, these, these folks, are, I mean, they, you know, 6,000 autopsies uh, since, I don't know, 2003, something like that. And anyway, they're, yeah, they, they, they're not fans of war. They're not, they're, so they're, um, yeah, some of the most fervent anti-war people you'll find are in the military, in, specifically in, in the communities that I was in. Mm -hmm. um, the pathologists, the medical examiners, the surgeons, the people who um, deal with the consequences of it. Um, anyway, on to stink bombs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Writing about smell is especially tricky, and it's something that I think a lot of people don't realize until they try to write about a smell. Um, and uh, you do a really, really good job in the chapter on, on the various types of stink bombs. Uh, but I was, I was wondering if you, could, if you could talk a little bit about that experience, or if you disagree with me, in fact, that, that, that writing about smell is, is weird. Um, writing about smell, particularly writing about very foul smells, overwhelmingly awful smells. It, it, it's very hard to describe in words the sensation of smelling, um, you know, stench soup, which is a contemporary uh, malodorant is the current phraseology, terminology for it. It's, it, you know, it's a, it's a non-lethal weapon. It's to clear, to clear a compound or to disperse a mob. It's, it's not harmful to people, but it is unbelievably smelly and horrible and revolting. Um, and, and it is so hard that I, after I left the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia, uh, did this work in the late 1990s to, to come up with this universally loathed smell, and they went around the world with these, like, sewage, burnt hair, vomit, uh, US government standard bathroom malodor. So, you know, like, taking them around to different cultures going, what do you think of this? And, then, and then the questionnaire was, it wasn't just like, do you find this appealing? They had things like, is this a wearable odor? Is this a, an edible odor? And almost all of them, you could find a culture that would go, yeah, I'd wear that. Yeah, I'll wear that. Uh, something like 3% three per, three of Caucasians found vomit smell to be an edible smell, I think. Um, so, the, but the one that won was U.S. government standard bathroom malodor, which was um, developed in, after World War II for the purpose of testing latrine deodorizing compounds. So they needed something, you know, a standardized, horrible latrine smell. And that one, around the world, people hated, they thought it was scary, dangerous, horrific. Anyway, um, anyway so, but, but to, to get to your specific question, I smelled a lot of these while I was at Monell Chemical Census Center. They had them under a fume hood, and they'd open it up and kind of like stand back. And, uh, but when I came home, and I was months, a couple months later writing the chapter, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember the smells. And I'd taken notes, and my notes would just go like, ew, <laughs> horrible. Like, I couldn't really find words for it, so I had them ship me, send me, 
these samples, which I then um, opened up out on our deck, because I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll open it up outside, but this, just, you couldn't go out on the deck for two days. I mean, just really <laughs> horrible. My husband's like, what have you done? <laughs> This is never going to go away. This is all, and it, it, I, I'm not a, I'm not a gaggy person. I, I rarely, as you can imagine, I rarely gag. I gagged just over some of the uh, butyric acid, which is it, uh, in kind of a small dose, smells like Parmesan cheese. But to, it, it's one of those context things: Parmesan cheese or vomit, depending on right. you know and. and appealing or not appealing depending on the circumstances. Same with uh, trimethylamine, which is a fishy odor or kind of a lady's odor. <laughs> 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 and one of the papers, the World War II papers, the guy said, pleasant or unpleasant depending on circumstances. I love that. <laughs> but anyway, Describing them, describing stench soup or who me, uh, the, the World War II one, um, I don't feel I did a very good job of it. I, and I, I, I almost took out the description I have because it just it felt lame. It is very hard to write about smells. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I mean, years ago, I reported a piece for National Geographic on, on chimpanzees, in, in, on the uh, savanna chimpanzees. and. Um, a chimp is their expressions and their behavior. It, it wants to be filmed. It's a visual thing, and to try to capture the expression or the antics of a chimp in words, I just felt like I kept failing over and over. Certain oh. things either need to be seen or smelled, and not written about. <laughs> <laughs> um, military research often bears fruit in uh, in sort of consumer technology and in, in daily life. Did you see anything in the course of writing this book that you think we, we will be seeing um, pretty soon, either on the shelves or, or in, in, in the course of, of an average day? Uh, I'm hoping that we don't see caffeinated meat. Yeah. Because I tried caffeinated meat, and it tastes the way caffeinated meat, you'd think the caffeinated meat would taste. Um, and one thing that was kind of cool, they, 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 um, they were the, the, at Natick Labs in Massachusetts, the accessories people, they, were, they had <laughs> uniforms, accessories. The accessories people, that's accessories a great tagline, people. I think. I know, that yeah. should be their little thing. Yeah. The we're the accessories people. They had shirts with these, um, that were, uh, I forget the exact technology, but it, I don't think it was solar, but the shirt, maybe it was solar, but it, it was a, a panel in, in the clothing that you could be charged, that would, you could sort of plug your, you could charge your phone or your computer with your shirt, which I thought, I mean, they, they probably weren't very attractive shirts, they probably, I mean, probably but for camping, I don't know, the, it yeah. just seemed like kind of wearable, a wearable charger seemed kind yeah. of like a cool thing to have. Um, a lot of the, the the most impressive stuff is is comes out of combat um, trauma care, like uh, when, uh, first just intense first aid, like um, r r improved tourniquets or um, a better needle for chest decompression if somebody's shot in the lung. If you're shot in the lung, the, and you inhale, the air starts building up outside the lung and then you can't inhale. So it's a matter of taking a needle and sticking it in and relieving that pressure. And, for, um, and one of the things, they, there's this program called Feedback to the Field at the, uh, at the morgue where they, where they have these teleconferences between the medical examiners and the people who rendered the care in the field. And, and, and then there's a slide of the, the person who had died and they, they leave on all the life-saving equipment it's all stays, it's part of the autopsy. And that way they can figure out, you know, is there anything we could have done differently here? Are we seeing the same problems over and over? Are people putting the tourniquet on in the right place? Are they, um, are they making any mistakes over and over? Um, and one of the things they figured out was that because there are so many soldiers who do weightlifting and bodybuilding as a pastime there, that their chests were so, their muscles were so developed that the needles weren't making their way to the, to the lung, to the chest. They were like barely clearing the muscle. So, and now they use longer needles. So just, so it's, you know, 
and, and that, rather than waiting for it to be published in a journal, they get, they'd have these teleconferences and they, the feedback to the people in Afghanistan or, who are doing the care, it happens really quickly. So, and then that makes its way into emergency care. And, and you know, so um, I think that, that the medical world, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's too bad that that's how, that's how we are learning things, but um, uh, that's a lot, a lot of advances and, and improvements in um, emergency medical care have come out of the military. That's in, that never occurred to me. Is that part of the reason why military research moves so far ahead? Because they don't have the sort of regulation periods that other, uh, that other sciences do? Oh, you mean because they don't, they're not waiting for publication and that kind of thing? Yeah, or? they're not waiting for publication. Well, for a long that. time they did. Uh, and I, I think it's, you know, the word gets back to the, the, the people in, overseas. Um, I don't know how quickly, I mean, I think they then do publish a paper. So I think it, it does make its plotting way back to um, civilian emergency care journals, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, was there a point, uh, I guess in the course of writing this book, but also just when you're writing a book, because you've, you've, you've done a few of these now, you've done a half dozen of these, is there a point where you, where you suddenly feel confident in your knowledge of, of the general subject? Uh, is there a point where you're, you're, your brain is full, for lack of a better term? Uh, no, I don't ever feel confident. I always, because I'm, I have this annoying habit of if every book I start over again, instead of building on the knowledge that I gained from one book and then being a better informed, smarter person as I go into the next book, I start completely over as an ignoramus. And I come a long way from ignoramus hood, but I'm still so far from being somebody who really knows what they're talking about. I always feel like I'm skating on thin ice and that I'm, you know, I may have the details right, but m my lack of, a, a, of background may cause me to say something that's kind of technically accurate, but if you know the stuff, you'll go, well, yeah, but, kind of, but so, no, but I, I never launch a book feeling confident yeah, I'm such an expert on this. Uh, I always launch a book thinking, I will get some feedback that will help me to make the paperback more accurate. <laughs> uh, what is the correction process like? Because I know, I mean, anytime you publish an article, there's always going to be a mistake yes. in it. And there's often an email where somebody's like, I really like this piece, but, but and the but is yes, always, yeah. yes. Um, uh, so you must get some, some, some crazy ones, uh, crazy emails like that after you publish. Um, I think my, my favorite was when Stiff came out, I got a letter from Dr. Dr. Kevorkian's assistant. And I had written about, before Dr. Death became known as Dr. Death, before he was doing um, euthanasia, he was working on a project uh, of transfusing cadaver blood, you know, trying to figure out how long after death is this blood viable for transfusion, and are we wasting a lot of blood that we could be using? And he wrote a paper, and it kind of sounded like he went ahead and transfused some cadaver blood into some living people without telling them. And it seemed like you might want to let him know. Anyway, I, I mentioned that, and Dr. Kevorkian's assistant wrote and said, I really enjoyed your book. Um, however, you made it sound like we didn't get permission, and we did actually get consent. And then he said, and I'm going to be sending a copy of your book to Dr. Kevorkian in the Thumb Correctional Facility. <laughs> and I kept waiting for the letter from Dr. Kevorkian, and I, I, never, I never did hear from him. No. Um, but... I, but I, um, yeah, no, people, usually people are, are, are very nice about it. You know, I really enjoyed the book. Just by the way, a scuba tank does not contain oxygen. It contains air. If it had oxygen, you'd be in trouble. So little, you know, just it's often, um, it's things I should have known. Like I actually knew that, but um, it, it's just, they kind of dribble in over the first few months and uh, you send, an, you, you keep a folder of them and you send them to the, um, to your editor and then they, fix them for the paperback, and hopefully the paperback has everything right. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we're gonna go into some audience questions now. Uh, 
how long does it take you to write the first draft of your books? Because you publish just about every three years, it seems like, more yeah, or less. Yeah, about, about three years, yeah. And it, it, it takes about three years, two and a half to... <laughs> Coincidentally... <laughs> I'm sorry, I just answered your question yeah. for you. I'm sorry. Um, it takes two and a half to three years to, to do a book. Um, if, if all of the research kind of lined up in a row, like this month I'm going to be here, and I mean, if I could kind of com compress all of it, I could, I could certainly do it faster, but it all, I'm writing one chapter while I'm waiting for another, I'm writing and researching at the same time, and it's kind of, and things fall apart, and, and things that I thought would, I'd be able to include don't work out, and I've got to pull something else in, so it's, it's a very f kind of fluid, amoebic process. This book, it's kind of just bulging out here for a while, and then it sticks out here, and I don't know, and in the end, it's, it is what it is, but it, it takes various shapes along the way. And do you, uh, another one of the questions is, you know, where, where you get the inspiration for them. I know you write smaller pieces. Um, do, do they come from that, or do you have an idea for a next book in your mind already, or? Um, I, I've never actually had a book grow out of a magazine piece, which is, I, I know a lot of times that does happen. I, I've had, Little well, that's, yes. Packing for Mars. There was a, a, a piece for Discover about the, how they train astronauts in this giant tank of you know, it's like a giant swimming pool, and they float around, and there's a mock-up of the ISS or part of it. So that was a component that kind of got me interested in in doing something that has to do with space travel. But um, it's rarely that. It, uh, it, it, my I, the ideas some sometimes it's just I read a sentence in an article, like I was reading for Bonk, which is about sex labs and, and bringing sexual physiology into the laboratory as for something to study and to figure out, which for uh, hundreds of years, nobody did. Uh, so um, it was a film quarterly. Some, I, I don't know why I was reading, I don't subscribe to film quarterly, but I was, happened to be looking through it and they mentioned the colposcopic films of Masters and Johnson. And I remember thinking colp col colposcopy is like a cervical biopsy or something like that. And I thought, this sounds like a film made inside a woman's body. <laughs> Ooh, wow, Masters and Johnson, 1950s, they were somehow filmed. And it turns out they, yeah, they had like a penis camera and they were the light source. And it was just that moment where I'm like, that is my next book. That sex research next book, that moment, in that moment. Other, uh, uh, and, uh, but often it's a more kind of meandering, oh, maybe that or the combination. What, what could I kind of, sometimes there'll be an element of um, just, just a nugget of something that is so great that I know I want to build a book around it. Like that horrible ad for Kohler faucets, it's the Kohler faucets where the guy, the, the couple goes into an architect's office with this faucet and they put it down on the architect's desk and they go, build a house around this. <laughs> so, so I'm, sometimes I'm like that with the, like the little, just something I know I, I need to put in a book, like for Packing for Mars. Years and years ago, I was reporting a piece on osteoporosis and I talked to, because there's a lot of bone loss in space, this researcher astronaut was, we were talking about bone loss and osteoporosis, which it doesn't, you know, I was like, that's whatever. And then we got on to other topics as happens when I'm on the phone. And he told me about this toilet with a video camera facing up with a closed circuit TV right there of your asshole. And you, to, to help in zero gravity, because you don't sit on a toilet, you kind of dock with it. And it's a small hole, and you've got to get it right. And the astronauts kept messing up, and they'd, they'd gum up the airflow, and it was, a, it was a bad situation. So they had this training toilet with a video camera. And in my head, I'm like, one day, I will write about this. <laughs> one day. Mark my words. 20 years went by, and I'm like, build a book around this. Yeah. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> or a chapter. So for all the aspiring authors in the audience, it's find your favorite crotch-related anecdote and then build a <laughs> book around it. Um, 
This this is maybe the best question I think I've ever seen uh, at, right. at one of these. Yeah, it's. I hope it's from a writer. Uh, it might not be. I don't know. Uh, the question is, what is the best way to find anecdotes about the liver? <laughs> it seems very appropriate for. Wow, you know. that's a really wonderful and specific question. It is. And like I said, I hope it's a writer. Yes, the best way to find. Well. Let me tell you, I wrote a book about the alimentary canal, which is basically from here to here, the tube. And the liver didn't get a chapter because I couldn't, there was no institute of liver research. There was not, I couldn't find a story around the liver and I failed. So I, I don't know the best way because I failed to find any story, narrative, scene, setting, whatever about the liver. So just left it out of the book. Just, wow. just like liver, forget it. You're out of here. So I, I don't know the best way to find an anecdote about the liver because I, did, I couldn't, I didn't. Wow, the liver's so important though. You'd think there'd oh, be- Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Staying on an anatomical tack, uh, did it hurt when they removed your embarrassment gland? <laughs> it was fairly painless, and I have it in a little jar on the mantle. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean... No, I, was, no, I think it was, a, it was a, a congenital defect. I was born without it. I was born without it. Is there, is there, are there things that you, that you just won't do, um, or, or is, is... What do you, what do you think? In the course of writing a book, uh, is, are there, are there, are there things that you're generally not, not willing to do to, to find a story for a book? Let me put it this way. Um, for this book, there's a chapter on... Maggot debridement therapy, which is if you have a, a, a wound and you need to, uh, there's a lot of dead tissue that needs to be debridement. That's important to heal a you know, wound. Uh, uh, and that can be done surgically. Or you can introduce maggots and they selectively dine on dead tissue, okay? And you, maggots are available by prescription. They are an approved, FDA approved medical device. There is a dosage and everything. There's a company called um, Medical Maggots. Anyway, so, but I was fascinated by what is, the, uh, what's the experience of, because a lot of times it's uh, diabetics with a, a foot, ul foot ulcers. It's very hard to get them to heal. And so the maggots are introduced. And I, I couldn't for the life of me imagine what is it like to look down at your body and watch live maggots, like how do you get used to that? And around that time I had eaten at a Korean restaurant and I'd burn myself on the, you know, when you get the babimbap and this hot stone yeah. thing, okay, it's really hot. And mm -hmm. I burned, it was kind of a, I think it might've been a third degree burn. And I, I, I thought maybe I could try it, try out some <laughs> maggots. And I um, actually talked to some of these MDs who do this, and they're like, I'm not, I'm not going to allow you to do this. I'm not going to. Well, I was, because I, I, the, 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 that wound had healed, and I was like, I think, I'm thinking maybe if I just go back to the Korean restaurant and go, Psh, kind of like in <laughs> Kung Fu. Remember in the beginning of Kung Fu, where he goes, he puts his wrists to burn the tattoo, and he goes, <laughs> so I thought, like, I'll just do that again. And then they can put, we can put the maggots in, and I could write about what that's like, because I could not. There's some things like weird, bad smells. There's some things it's, it's hard to write about the experience without experiencing it. Um, so the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> I, now I have, uh, I wonder if there's a backstory to the genital reconstruction chapter that. Oh gosh, no, okay, <laughs> yeah, Ooh, yeah. Uh, out of all your books, uh, which did you enjoy writing the most and why? Um, I've enjoyed the writing of them about the same, but the researching of Packing for Mars, I, I really enjoyed because I got to uh, fulfill a lifetime dream of being wait, going on the, one of those weightless sim simulated, well, weightlessness simulated zero G, the plane that goes, and you have, as it goes over and down, you have like 20 some seconds where you're 
a soap bubble. You're floating. You have no weight. You're floating. You're hanging in the air. It's so cool. And I always wanted to do that. And I badgered NASA for months. Because you, you can go as a journalist with this program, the Student Flight Opportunities, but they have the, they, they have the requirements. They go, you must be a full-time journalist with a newspaper, radio station, or television station. I'm like, well, I'm not, but I think if you look at my credentials, you must be a full-time journalist. At a... <laughs> so I, I had to really wear them down to a stub. And I finally, I, I did make my way onto the flight. But, but so that was really the most fun. Yeah. Has, uh, has your research ever resulted in your making extreme behavioral changes? Extreme behavioral changes? Ah, uh, no. I don't, I can't think of any extreme behavioral changes. Huh. You haven't, you haven't learned anything from the writing of your books that you're, that is, <laughs> Change the That's course a change. Of your life? The, it's changed my behavior. I'd have yeah. to think on that one. Okay. Uh, let me see. Um. Oh yeah. All right. I got one. I got one. Um, after I when I wrote Stiff, I had a chapter that had to do with um, the forensics. After a plane crash, if there's no black box, sometimes the um, they can look at the bodies and figure out what happened in the air, like if it was an explosion from what side of the plane, et cetera. But anyway, the guy that I was interviewing happened to just drop some facts, like he, him, I said, where do you sit on a plane? And he said, I don't ever sit in an aisle seat because even if fairly, even in, you know, just extreme turbulence, the luggage can come through the overhead bin and it will hit the aisle, person in the aisle seat on the head. So he sits in the window, so I'm, I'm not as, I'm not. <laughs> so, yeah. I think you changed a lot of lives I tonight. I may have changed. I may have modified some behavior. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And then his actual answer to the where do you sit on the plane, he said, if possible, first class. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, you might have changed a little less behavior with that part. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Was, uh, oh, see, this, this, this person has taken the opposite attack from me. Was there a topic in Grunt where you were particularly proud of your description? Oh, I was I particularly proud of a description? Um, you know, I had a description that I'm, I liked the writing, but I, I worried about it that the, the man who I was describing wouldn't like it, okay? I describe, and he, I, I really like overbites, like Liv Tyler, I think is really sexy. She has this great overbite. I love overbites. I think they're sexy. That's the background for this. <laughs> okay, and there was a guy at the um, damage control trainer at the submarine school who had a real overbite, and I, you know, where his, when he talks, sometimes his teeth hit his lower, I described his teeth hitting his lower lip like children jumping on a bed. <laughs> And I kind of liked the line, but then I worried that I, I worried that he'd feel self-conscious about it. But anyway, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a I was very conflicted about that <laughs> particular description. Right. Uh, what do you read for fun? And I guess as a corollary, what have you been reading lately? Um, I've been on a Charles Portis kick. I read oh. Norwood is the funny. I mean, he's he's right. Charles Portis. He wrote True Grit which I would never have picked up because I just associate it with John Wayne. Mm -hmm. Well, the Coen brothers did a much better version. Um, but it's, it's just this perfect novel. It's so, he, he, I was going to compare him to Cormac McCarthy, but I, that's not even right. But he's a beautiful literary poetic writer, but he's funny as hell. He's so, uh, so good. And, and so I read, I read True Grit recently and Norwood, which is just this, on, this ludicrous, quick read, very funny beautifully written. Uh, Have so. you read Masters of Atlantis by Portis? No, it's no. It's very good. It's about no. conspiracy theories. It's very funny. Is it nonfiction? It's fiction. Oh, it's fiction. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. So do you, do, you, do you not read? What's your relationship to reading fiction and nonfiction, especially when you're in the middle of a book? Oh, I, I, liked, I like both nonfiction. I mean, I just read Dead Wake by Eric Larson, which I mm -hmm. liked a lot. Um, partly, yes. That's right, he's a local yeah. writer. Yes, local writer and lovely man. Uh, part, I was interested in it for two reasons. One, it's Eric Larson, who I really like, and also my dad came over on the Lusitania in 1913, so uh, 
I was curious about that. So, but I don't, when I'm working, uh, when I'm working on a book in a subject area, I, I don't want to read, like I didn't read redeployment. I didn't, when I worked on packing for Mars, I wouldn't go near the right stuff. Mm -hmm. I just, it, you know, to read another wonderfully written, well-researched book in the neighborhood of your book just makes me want to go like, forget it. Why am I doing this? <laughs> what am I doing? So I, st I stay away. Yeah. Uh, and let me see. How do you strike a balance between communicating the science enough to educate without slipping too much into tech jargon? Because you're in between. You're learning about things, and then you have to impart to readers. Do you find it difficult to to sort of to strike that balance? What was the the, the balance between? Uh, between communicating the science enough to educate without slipping too much into tech jargon. Oh, tech jargon. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, that that's something that uh, I think it helps to not have us have a science background because I'm I'm less likely to slip into jargon because I don't know it. <laughs> so um, even though it it, it it makes it a little more difficult for me to get up to speed in a topic, I, I I've got to spend I've got to treat I treat my the people I'm interviewing like unpaid tutors. They're very patient, mm -hmm. uh, but it does make it easier for me to communicate on and have a sense of how technical the language should be, which is not technical. Uh, you know, and I'm also very aware of wanting, I mean, sometimes with science writing, somebody will be describing something, and then suddenly they'll get to the science, and they'll shift completely into science speak. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the things I like about Bill Bryson is when he does write about science, he's using exactly the same kind of fresh language and surprising turns of phrase to explain the, the science, or whatever it is, as he as he is for the, the narrative and the description. Mm -hmm. So there's, a there's just a nice balance. So um, anyway, uh, it's, it's something I have to just, I have to police myself on and make sure, because some, you know, some, there's a tendency sometimes if there's, it's a, a bit of a slog, the science, you, you, you like to, to pull a quote from the researcher and just go, I'll let him say it. You know, but the, and, and unless it's a really fresh way of saying it or something surprising, usually that's just laziness. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you need to translate the quote into your own language and, and um, explanation in a way that just kind of fits the style that you're working in, yeah. Okay, and uh, along the lines of, uh, of interviewing, um, this is a question, I think they're asking for tips on, on how uh, how, do you, how do you come up with uh, the questions, and do you have any advice for young writers? Because you get amazing quotes out of people. They are, they are, they're just, uh, I, I, I've read some quotes and I can totally see a person saying that, but I cannot see a person saying that to a, a reporter. Uh, <laughs> and it just seems like I, I've never seen you do an interview, but it must be an, an, an incredible thing to see. Um, yeah, because it doesn't look like an interview because I don't really have a list of questions. And it, I mean, I do some background before I go. I, I familiarize myself with, with the papers that the person has written. Um, but I don't have a list of questions because I am pretty sure that until I get there, I'm not going to know what the most interesting questions are. I need them to lead me to what's the most interesting material. And um, so, it, you know, it takes a certain amount of courage to show up kind of without an agenda. But the other thing is that you, if there's something you need to know, you can always, you know, some, some, something technical or something that you need to have explained, you can always call back, you can always email. So when I'm with someone, I'm, I'm, I'm really more concerned about something happening that, is, that will be an interesting story to tell and like a context for the science. So um, I, I'm really letting just the, letting the conversation roll and when they start to, describe something that's interesting or surprising, you know, I, I go along that trail with them. So uh, I'm, uh, it's more just letting, being comfortable with letting them take me to, inter to places that I didn't know existed until I got there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, and I'm always so impressed with, with radio interviewers who have these really smart questions all laid out and the whole, like, or what you've done here, I mean, that, yeah. I, that I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, um, uh, and I also, and I just, I spend a couple, of, when I can, I make a real pest of myself, I stay for a couple of days, mm -hmm. 
And just it's just like you know, the more time you're there, the more time there is for something interesting to happen or to be said or to, you know. Um, and, and I don't, as someone pointed out, I don't have any um, embarrassment. I mean, I, I say, I ask questions that perhaps seem inappropriate, but are, but the, you know, the thing, if you're talking to somebody who, who's dated, whose daily work is, involves cadavers or penis reconstruction or they're a sex researcher, these aren't awkward topics for them. This is just right. their daily bread. This is like, it's like, for them, it's like talking about tire rotation or they don't, right. it's not, it's not, so it's not really that awkward, it's not as awkward as you would imagine to ask these mm -hmm. questions. That, um, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, if you have your own questions, you can feel free to bring them to Mary Roach. She will uh, be signing books over there in a moment. Uh, and uh, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Mary Roach, for, for being here tonight with us. Thank you.